My name is Neil Vandry, and I'm your officiator here tonight. It's my pleasure to welcome you to another service here at our wonderful ch church. And if this is your first time joining us, uh, I'd like to especially invite you to join our email list so that you can get updates on health and longevity, know about all the events going on here at the church. If you're online, send me an email through our website, and we'll make sure that you get those details for what's going on. We want to make sure that you can live a long and healthy and prosperous life. So glad to have you here. All right. Let's start off with our creed, the Perpetual Life Creed. Now, the Church of Perpetual Life is not a Bible-based church. We are a science-based church. And our creed, we believe that all of life is sacred and that we have been given this one life to make unlimited. We believe in our Creator's divine plan for all of humanity to have infinite lifespans in perfect health and eternal joy, rendering death to be optional. By following our prophets, we achieve eternal life, creating a heaven here on earth. We follow Nikolai Fedorov, who taught that the transcendence of the Creator will only be solved when humanity, through our unified efforts, becomes an instrument of universal resuscitation, when the divine word becomes our divine action. And we follow Arthur C. Clarke, who said, the only way to discover the limits of the, of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And so we enter each day energized in spirit and empowered by the words of our prophets to live in joy, serving our creator and humanity forever and ever. Again, as I said, we are not a Bible-based church. Our members are Christian, you're Jewish, atheist, agnostic. Uh, we are all transhumanists. And what brings us together is the search for all of us to find a way to live an unlimited lifespan in perfect health and for that to go on forever. I'd like to point out that we have someone here today, Sandy Martin, who's the founder of the Biohacker Expo in Miami. Sandy is right here, and she's here to give you a free pass for one day to the Biohacker Expo. If you'd like to go, it's going to be February 23rd through the 25th. William Shatner is going to be there along with a couple of dozen great speakers throughout that weekend of the February 23rd through the 25th. See Sandy if you want to get a free pass for one day to the Biohacker Expo in Miami. So great to have you, Sandy. Our services here are once a month. Once a month we have events here, and you're welcome to come. And if you're not here in person, you're welcome to Zoom in live to our events. Okay, our next service will be February the 22nd. That's the fourth Thursday in February. And we'll be announcing later on who that speaker is. We actually have a speaker, but there may be a shuffle of the March speaker and the February speaker. So we'll be telling you about those in the upcoming newsletters. So let's uh, bring on our first speaker tonight. We have three people coming up tonight, and our first speaker is Jose Cordero. Some of you may have met him. He's going to be doing a book signing after the presentation. He's an internationally acclaimed engineer, economist, futurist, and transhumanist who has worked on areas including economic development, international relations, Latin America, the European Union, monetary policy, comparison of constitutions, energy trends, cryonics, and life extension. Jose has written several books, but his latest, The Death of Death, is now available in English. I've read it, it's an excellent read. You wanna get a copy for yourself. And as I mentioned, he's going to be doing a book signing after the event tonight at the back table here. So please make note of any of your questions for Jose, as there will be a 10-minute question and answer period after he speaks. Let's bring up Jose Cordero. And I want to tell you a few things that have been going on since last time I was here. I had the pleasure to present uh, my book in Spanish uh, about five years ago. And the world has changed radically in the last five years. Uh, longevity research has been advancing exponentially, so I'm really excited. So I, I just want to begin with uh, showing you a few of the things I have done myself in terms of longevity in the last five months, which I, I find truly fascinating. But before that, to put it in context, uh, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin, very famous, I love him, but he said in this world, uh, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. And I think he was wrong. I don't like taxes, and I like death even less. 
and we should get rid of taxes and death. So I just came yesterday from an experiment worldwide, which is called Vitalia.city. Vitalia. And you can see the goal of Vitalia is to make death optional. Death optional. 200 scientists, researchers, investors, scientists, biohackers are getting together in this island in Honduras to make death optional. I was there for the first two weeks. Um, it plans to be the uh, Los Alamos for longevity, to create a warp speed movement towards curing aging. Actually, people like Brian Johnson go there for some therapies which are not allowed in the USA because the FDA is a horrible bureaucracy. So Brian Johnson was there a few weeks ago for some therapies like folistatin therapy. And I gave a talk uh, on Sunday uh, about what is happening in my book in the next few, few days. Before going to Honduras, I was in Argentina with the president of Argentina. And actually, uh, you can see him with my book and I'm really proud. He said it is his favorite book. He has the Spanish copy of my book from five years, and he has in the center of his own personal uh, library in his home. And he is the first president who is an immortalist, who is a libertarian, and who even cloned his dog. When his dog, dog died um, uh, five years ago, he I, I was talking to him in 2016, uh, that his dog was aging, and, and then I said, why don't you clone it? And he did it. In 2017, he cloned his dog. No president has done that. And besides that, what I love is he's an immortalist, and he is also a libertarian. Before Argentina, uh, last days of November, first days of December, I was in Saudi Arabia for the first time. I was in Riyadh for the big announcement from Evolution Foundation, which begins with an endowment of $20 billion. And they announced the Longevity X Prize that begins with $101 million. Um, I was there here with Peter Diamandis and my friend Dan, Dana Marduk, who is also collaborating with me in another initiative that I will show in a minute, in the Middle East. Uh, the Evolution Foundation, this is the highest prize ever in human history, $101 million that should be uh, given to the winner by the year 2030. There are seven years for any startup companies, universities, uh, to compete, to be able to rejuvenate people between the ages of 65 and 80, at least 10 years in three biological systems. The immune system, the um, muscular system, and the neurological system. And this is an incredible goal, and I think we are going to do it because, in fact, some of the competitors in this prize are people so important like George Church from Harvard and MIT. And George Church said, live from Saudi Arabia, that he wanted to win the prize. And then uh, Eric Verdin, who is the director of the Buck Institute in California, he said, no, 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 we will win it. So there is a competition from many top people on this, and this will revolutionize uh, the signs of longevity. And before going to Saudi Arabia, I was in November in Dubai, in the Museum of the Future. They are now very interested in longevity. And I gave a presentation with top scientists like um, James Kirkland, who is one of the experts on senolytics at the Mayo Clinic, and Alex Shavoronkov, that has one of the biggest companies in uh, drug discovery using artificial intelligence called in silico medicine about immortality. So Dubai also, the United Arab Emirates are very interested. And in, um, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, they were really fascinated about the idea that we can reverse aging. And before going to Dubai, uh, we also organized with my friend Dana Marduk this uh, worldwide network state called Health Jevity, which is health and longevity. And we basically uh, want to invite you to join this journey and to become ambassadors, ambassadors of immortality. This health Jevity nation is going to use the idea of exponential organizations that we developed 10 years ago at Singularity University to democratize health throughout the planet. We are going to have a health Jevity coin. We are going to have health Jevity courses, health Jevity school, health Jevity university, health Jevity centers. We will open the first health Jevity center in Vancouver, Canada by the end of the year. We are going to have longevity cruises also in the Caribbean and in the Mediterranean. And we plan to have a longevity parliament and maybe a longevity president. So this is moving very fast. So I invite you all to 
joined this initiative that has been born two months ago in the Middle East. And another initiative that I am supporting totally is vitalism.io. Let's make freedom from biological aging and death human, humanity's number one priority. More and more people are understanding that this is real, this is scientific, and that we are getting closer and closer. Before that, on October 1st, we celebrate International Longevity Day. In different parts of the world, we had different um, activities. I organized a conference and then a rally in Madrid, where I live. In Madrid, we went to the most famous place in Madrid, which is the City Hall of Madrid, which is where Real Madrid, the best soccer football team in the world, celebrates. Real Madrid. So in this fantastic place, we actually began the march. We had a rally, a march in the City Hall. We had beautiful uh, shirts and balloons. I, my balloon dropped there, but I have some balloons so, so that you can see really beautiful balloons, and we had T-shirts about this. Uh, we went to the state government. We went to the Congress of Spain, to the Spanish National Congress. And then we finished in the uh, Madrid office of the European Parliament. So this is becoming more and more important also in social sectors, in political sectors. And before that, the Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation, led by Aubrey de Grey, announced the Dublin Longevity Declaration. This is the biggest effort led by scientists, 100 top scientists throughout the planet, saying that we can cure aging, we can reverse aging. And there are thousands of other people. All of you are welcome to sign it, please. Dublin Longevity Declaration. And before that, I was in the most interesting, biggest event for immortalists in the world, which is called the Revolution Against Aging and Death. And I invite you all to join us also in September this year. In, uh, it will be in the same place in Anaheim, Los Angeles, 2024. So uh, Bill Falloon will be there, of course, and uh, people like Liz Parrish, Aub uh, Aubrey de Grey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now, let me tell you a little bit about me. I was born in Venezuela, which means Picola Venezia. When uh, my parents left Spain, my family is originally from Spain, but they left Spain when Spain was poor and a dictatorship. And Venezuela was wealthy and a democracy. So that you can see how fast things can change. Because Spain is no longer a dictatorship and is not a poor country, while Venezuela is very poor and a horrible dictatorship. Anyway, so I left uh, Venezuela. I was an advisor to Irene Saez Conde, who was uh, uh, a presidential candidate in the last free elections in 2018. It sounds like, excuse me, 1998, 1998, a long, long, long time ago. Anyway, so the beauty, she had been Miss Universe, 1980, Irene Saez Conde, Miss Universe, and so she ran to be president, but it was not the beauty who won the election, it was the beast the beast, Hugo Chavez. And so because of that now, 8 million Venezuelans have had to leave Venezuela. But anyway, um, I was lucky enough to study at MIT. I was working before in energy. Now I am totally devoted to longevity. I am devoted to longevity, not 100%, but 200%, maybe 300%. I only do longevity-related activities now, only. And my goal in life is to kill death before death kills me. And I think all of us, all of us should do that. Uh, I also lead the Millennium Project, which is the biggest um, futurist think tank in the planet. It began with the United Nations University, even though now we are an independent NGO. And I coordinate the efforts for Latin America and Spain. And we publish uh, books about the global challenges, uh, reports like this one that we presented at the United Nations uh, last year. And we talk about the year 2050 with three scenarios. In one of those scenarios, by the year 2050, we are immortal. So we are taking this to the United Nations so that people know that this is really not only possible, that we are very close to reaching biological immortality. And I also coordinated a study about 2013 in Latin America. I presented that at the famous World Economic Forum, Davos in Switzerland. Switzerland, with uh, people like the Nobel Prize Mario Vargas Llosa, who wants to be immortal. By the way, he doesn't want to die. Uh, he's like 85, and he's looking for a third wife, by the way. 
Uh, so he wants to be rejuvenated. He believes in this. Anyway, in 2009, I was one of the founding faculty of Singularity University, where we talk about these things. We talk about biological re rejuvenation. And uh, the idea was popularized by my dear friend, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is also from MIT. And he, he says that basically technology is advancing exponentially. And soon we will reach the point of the singularity. In fact, by the year 2045. And at that time, we will reach the singularity and immortality. Immortality. As you can see, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. But for the ladies here, also women will become immortal. All of us, all of us will become immortal. Why? Because technology is changing, advancing exponentially, faster, things are smaller, cheaper, and better. Um, and this began with technology, science and technology at the end, at uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century to the 19th century. Before that, we were in the Malthusian trap. There was no economic growth until the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in the 19th century, there was incredible economic growth, 100%. In the 20th century, 400% economic growth. And in this century, it's probably going to be 5,000, 6,000. We are truly living in incredible times. The first country that doubled its income per capita in history was the United Kingdom. And it took 58 years between seven, uh, 17, um, 80 and 1838, 58 years to be the first country in history to double its income per capita. Now countries have been learning, learning, learning. And today we know how to double the income per capita. In only 10 years, if a country does the proper things, we can advance economically. But population is stabilizing and it is beginning to decline in some countries. Actually, since last year, we reached peak China and the population of China is declining, and India overtook China. The population of China, it is estimated to drop to less than half what it is today, from 1.43 billion to only 700 million people. This is if, if like the population of the USA disappeared twice. So not only China, the population is declining. In Europe, in Japan, in Russia, the population is already declining. In India, it will stabilize soon in two decades, and even in Africa, it is going to stabilize in three decades. So it is a myth that there is overpopulation. In fact, there will be soon underpopulation in the planet. However, the good news is that the economy keeps on growing. This is what has happened in 200 years of economic evolution, GDP per capita. In the year 1800, it was about $1,000 per person per year. Today, it is over $10,000 per person per year. And some countries like uh, Ireland, Qatar, Luxembourg have over $100,000 per person per year. And the trend is that this will continue. And look at the scale. It is logarithmic scale that implies exponential growth. So the economy keeps on growing, uh, even though the population is stabilizing. You can look at the Dow Jones Industrial Index. It is growing exponentially for over two centuries. World War I, World War II, COVID, anything. It keeps on growing and it will continue. The economy keeps on growing exponentially. In fact, we are moving from the economies of scarcity into the economics of abundance. There will be more and more. We will produce more and more with less and less resources. Even life expectancy is increasing. At the time of the Roman Empire, life expectancy was less than 25 years. Who has here 24 or less? No one. So all of us could be dead on average at the time of the Roman Empire, all of us. I could be dead twice, uh, twice and a half almost. I could be dead. But I am not dead, also I don't plan to die. But look how interesting, life expectancy keeps on increasing and what grows the most is education. And that is why the world is changing, because we are more educated, we know more, we can do more things. And this will only continue. We will continue increasing life expectancy and education. This is happening exponentially. And I like to make the big difference between linear change and exponential change. 
If I give 30 linear steps, each step of one meter, after 30 steps, I have walked 30 meters. But if I walk exponentially, after 30 exponential doublings, 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 I have walked over one billion meters. I'm gonna plan about planet Earth 26 times. How many of us understand this? We don't understand this because we think linearly, but technology is changing exponentially. So we have to get ready from a change from the local and linear world into an exponential and global planet. Everything is changing. All the companies from the past are being overtaken by companies of the future. At Singularity University, we used to say, Uber yourself before you get Kodak. We need to see that the change is coming in every industry. So I'm a futurist, and futurist, we talk about four ways to think about the future. Passive, like the ostrich. You don't want to see what is going to happen. You hide your head. Horrible. You suffer the future. Horrible. A little bit less bad is to be reactive. You react when there is a problem, like the firefighters, they come when there is a fire. It is better to be proactive, like when you buy insurance for cryonics, for example. But the best thing is to be proactive because we can create the future. We can construct the future that we want. So I hope that we don't have ostriches here because ostriches are not really from Florida. But if we have ostriches, they should be technological ostriches that use technology to see what is going to happen in the future. 40 years ago, when I went to MIT, I used this technology. This was the punch card, IBM punch card. This is basically 10 by 100. There were different sizes, but 10 by 100, that makes 1,000. This was 1K, 1K of memory. I used this at MIT, fortunately. Right after arriving at MIT, the first electromagnetic memories were invented. This is one of the first ones, eight inches and also 1K. But this 1K was better because you could erase and it had a bigger hole. <laughs> but 40 years ago, we had 1K, in Spanish we say 1K plus 1K, 1K plus 1K makes 1K, 1K. At MIT, I use K. In fact, I wrote my first thesis at MIT on a caca technology called typewriter. I don't know if, they, if you remember, in the museums, the caca technology of typewriters. Anyway, so we move from a caca to a 512 cacas to 1.4 mega, and here I have a pen drive of one terabyte, one terabyte. In 40 years, we have gone from caca to terabytes. What do you think is going to happen in the next 20 years? In the next 20 years, you will remember me and you will remember Kaka. But this will be Kaka in 20 years. One terabyte will be Kaka in less than 20 years, yes. <laughs> but now this is moving from computers to biology, to medicine. The first human genome was sequenced between 1990 to 2003. It cost over $1 billion just to the U.S. government and 13 years. Today, in 224, we will reach full sequence of the genome for $100 in one day. But that's nothing compared to what will happen, $10 in one hour. This is more exponential than caca. You know, caca is a caca compared to what is happening in biology. Biology is moving faster, faster than what happened in computer science. So I like to say that uh, I sequenced my genome many times with many companies. I will show you the partial sequence of my genome. A company like 23andMe does partial sequence. And you can see which diseases you will have. What is the, the, the risk, the risk of me having cancer, Alzheimer's, etc. Isn't it fascinating to know what you might die of? So that you don't die of that. Because the medicine of the future will be preventive. Uh, based on your genes, but also you will discover where you come from. You know, this is my paternal line several centuries ago based on my genes, and you can see famous people related to me on the bottom right, uh, Genghis Khan. So no one mess around with me. <laughs> this is my paternal line. 
Now I'll show my maternal line. And you can see my mother descends from Maria Antoinette. So I have a good, excellent pedigree between Hengis Khan and Maria Antoinette. All of you will know where you come from once you sequence your genome. Remember, $10 in five years. And uh, you will be able to verify for the first time if your father is really your father. Isn't this interesting? But better than knowing the past is knowing the future. And so um, at Singularity University, I sequenced my genome and I shared it with my students. Uh, this, this was a theoretical experiment to see how our children could be and to choose the genes that you want for your children. This will be a standard in 10 years. Actually, let me tell you, all of you are here by mistake. You were not designed. None of us has been designed. In the future, we will be designed. And at the end of the day, we are not that complicated. We are only three gigabytes of data. Our genome is three gigabytes of data. This pen drive is one terabyte. How many humans can I fit here? I can fit 333 humans and a little dog in this pen drive. So we are not complicated biologically, only three gigabytes of data. And now we are moving from reading to writing genomes, writing. The first genome was written, artificial genome, was written in the year 2000 for a virus. Virus are simpler, smaller. In 2010, the first artificial bacteria was created by Craig Venter and his team. At this stage, it is for sure that by 2045, we will get to the complexity of the human genome and we will be able to write and rewrite and improve and change the human genome. 15 years ago, I went to visit uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, famous for uh, uh, science fiction books and movies like Space Odyssey 2001. And he was a genius and he's one of the prophets of the Church of Perpetual Life. And he wrote the three laws of the future. First law of the future. When a famous scientist says that something is possible, he's probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he's probably wrong. Second law, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture past those limits into the impossible. And third law of the future, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So this is what the future brings, magic. We are going to have magic. 30 years ago, personal computers were really just beginning. 20 years ago, cell phones. 10 years ago, Google, Facebook, and other companies were becoming global. But what will happen in 10, 20, 30 years? We are going to have immortal cells, ageless cells, which has been the biggest dream of humanity since the beginning of written history. 5,000 years ago, the first book was the Epic of Gilgamesh about immortality in Mesopotamia. But not, not only Mesopotamia, the Egyptians, the Book of the Dead is about immortality. And the famous Chinese emperor, Qin Shi Huang, that built the Terracotta Army, he was looking for immortality. Or here in Florida, Juan Ponce de Leon came here looking for the fountain of eternal youth. And in all religions as well, the goal is immortality. In all religions, like in the Bible, Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So now we just came back from this horrible pandemic called COVID. The number one risk factor, as you can see, is age. Age is the number one risk factor. And COVID was really a tiny pandemic, tiny, tiny pandemic, what I call a caca pandemic. A caca pandemic. If you really want to see a big pandemic, that was the bubonic plague. It killed one out of every three Europeans. One out of every three Europeans died because of the bubonic uh, plague. That was really horrible. Or uh, smallpox, 56 million people. A Spanish flu, which was not a Spanish and was not the flu, killed also, it is estimated, 50 million people when the population of the planet was much, much smaller than today a century ago. Those were really big pandemics. COVID is a caca pandemic, and it paralyzed the planet. How can a caca pandemic paralyze the planet when all of us are dying of aging? 
We are not dying of COVID. All of us are dying of uh, aging because aging is the number one risk factor of all diseases. If you compare different diseases, influenza, cancer, heart attacks, Alzheimer's, anything basically, risk factor number one is your age. Aging is the problem. It is not COVID. It is not the Russians. It is not climate change. Um, it is not religion. The problem is aging. That's the problem of, of all humanity. And also, we had considered different diseases separately. Now we have to consider them integrated and around aging. Aging is the mother of all chronic diseases. Aging is the enemy, the main enemy. If we stop aging, we stop heart attacks, we stop dementia, we stop um, uh, most cancers, etc. So the enemy is aging. So uh, also we have learned that uh, aging is very flexible. There are mammals like us, mammals that live uh, maybe two years, some, some mice. And then there are whales that live over 200 years, mammals. So how can a mammal go from two years and another to 200 years? Or if we look at other animals, sharks. Sharks live 500 years. And bird, uh, uh, trees, there are trees that live thousands and thousands of years. So w there is a lot of flexibility in the aging. And now we are beginning to understand that flexibility of aging. So five years ago, my fantastic co-author, David Wood, who is a science doctor from uh, Cambridge University, and me, I, I studied in Cambridge, but Massachusetts, we decided to write a book about the number one problem of humanity, which I repeat, is not the Russians, is not climate change, is not religion, it is uh, even accidents. No, no, the number one problem is that we all, we all are dying of aging. So we published the book that I was happy to present here five years ago before the pandemic, and now this book, from the, before the pandemic is a caca book. Caca book, because technology has advanced incredibly in the last five years, incredibly. So uh, there were no, no vaccines, there was no mRNA technology, there was no CRISPR, uh, there was no alpha folding for uh, protein folding. Incredible things ha have happened in the last um, five years, which are here in this book that just came out, the Eng English edition. So anyway, we are donating the royalties of the book to two foundations, uh, one uh, Sense Research Foundation, which was the previous foundation of, of Aubrey de Grey, and a half in Spain to a scientific foundation. The book uh, came first, uh, first in Spanish, then in Portuguese, then in French, uh, then in Russian. Uh, this is very interesting. In Russian, uh, it came in two versions. Uh, the, the one on the left sells 80% more than the one on the right. And, uh, and in Russia, they changed the name. In Russian, it is called Death Must Die. Very Russian, Death Must Die. So the book is in many languages, uh, and now it's coming out in Chinese for the Chinese New Year. I'm really excited. They also changed the name in Chinese. In Chinese, if you can read Chinese, it means eternal life, eternal life. They don't like to use the word death in Chinese. So anyway, the book is a global bestseller, and I am so happy and so proud to be able to present it here because people like Bill Falun has written a beautiful testimonial, and he has helped a lot, in fact, in the Life Extension magazine next month, well, for April, there is a, an interview made with artificial intelligence to the book. This, this was a beautiful experiment. I didn't participate in, in the interview. It was artificial intelligence answering after reading my book. Uh, fantastic, fantastic, and, and the artificial intelligence answered very well, actually maybe better than me. So really fantastic what is happening and how artificial intelligence is hel helping us. The book now is coming out in, Chin in Chinese because China is suffering a horrible demographic implosion. As I mentioned, the population of China is going to less than double, and China will be country number three by the end of the century. Country number one will be India, with less population than now because the population will also decline in India. But then Nigeria is growing very, very fast. Anyway, um, after this, the many countries, the population is going down or stabilizing. Spain actually has the second life expectancy in the world after Japan among the big countries. Of course, there is Monaco that has more life expectancy or uh, um, Hong Kong. 
but among countries, big countries, over 10 million people, it is Japan with 85 years of life expectancy and Spain with 84.5 years in the planet. So this is a very important issue in Spain and all over Europe. Life expectancy in Europe actually is five years more than in the USA. So this is a big issue because Europe is aging faster and it is already more age than the USA. So I ran as a political uh, Spanish candidate to the European Parliament and I was really happy that I got over um, 7,000 votes in Madrid and I can tell you I don't know 7,000 people. So I was really excited that in a quick campaign for the European Parliament talking about aging, there was already so much interest uh, five years ago. My idea was to change the old lemma of Spain, that's the Spanish flag, that it used to say non plus ultra, nothing far beyond, until America was discovered. When America was discovered, the name of Spain became the country of plus ultra, far beyond, something far beyond. But now my goal is that it becomes Vita plus ultra, life far beyond. Because Spain is one of the top five countries in terms of research on longevity today in the world. And so the idea is to consider aging as a disease, but a curable disease. As I mentioned, I talked to the new president of Argentina about this idea. Let's see if he finally managed to convince other people in, uh, in Argentina, but that's good. that would be a fantastic example. One country, a big country like Argentina, declaring aging as a curable disease. In the last two decades, we have been able to extend the lifespan of mice two times. Um, uh, mosquitoes four times and some worms ten times. So we have worms that live the equivalent of 1,000 human years, the equivalent in worm years. These are called the Methuselah worms because they live a thousand years equivalent. And do you think scientists do these worms or these mos mosquitoes or uh, mice because they love mice and mosquitoes? No, because this is to uh, apply on humans, to apply on humans. So we are moving closer and closer to doing this in humans. In fact, today we know that immortality exists, biological immortality. And this was sadly discovered in 1951, not yesterday, 73 years ago. It was discovered when Henrietta Lacks died of a horrible cervical cancer. She was born in 1920 and she died in 1951 from a huge cervical cancer. And the doctors began analyzing the cancer and they discovered that cancer, if it has food and water, it does not die. It does not age. It keeps on growing. That cancer that she had, uh, it's called the Hela, Hela cells, Henrietta Lacks, is alive. Over a hundred years, it's centenarian, and it is alive. And it reproduces like teenagers. Cancer discovered immortality. So when people tell me that immortality is impossible, I say, how is it impossible? It already exists in nature, and cancer discovered it. And cancer didn't go to university. Cancer didn't go to MIT. Cancer doesn't even know how to read. And it discovered immortality. So we are very close to understand what cancer does, now that we can sequence cheaply the human genome. But not only cancer is immortal because it's bad. The best cells which are the germ cells, the reproductive cells, are also biologically immortal, which means that they do not age. That doesn't mean that they don't die. If the person dies, the germ cells in our bodies die, but they don't age. So it is important. Immortality already exists. We have immortal cells in our body. And there are a small immortal organisms, like hydras, like the immortal jellyfish, animals that do not age biologically. And the most beautiful thing, I believe, is that the purpose of life is life. The first life forms of the planet, bacteria, small bacteria, with run chromosomes, they do not age. During three billion years, there were bacteria that didn't age. Their telomere, uh, telomeres were round, and they didn't have, I, I mean, their chromosomes were round, and they didn't have telomeres, because they were round, no ending on the chromosome. So these bacteria did not age. Life was born to live, not to die. So my dear friend, Aubrey de Grey, who wrote the prologue of the book, he has been talking about these ideas for 20 years. And he was called a charlatan by MIT. The MIT Technology Review called him a charlatan in 2005. 
They said it was impossible, that we could not cure aging. Look at the incredible change of opinion of MIT Technology Review 14 years later. Old age is over, if you wanted, at the front cover of the same magazine, 14 year time difference. Actually, Arthur Schopenhauer, the famous German uh, philosopher said it, all truth passes three stages. First stage, it is ridiculed. Second stage, it is violently opposed. And third stage, it is accepted as self-evident. In the future, we are going to accept curing aging as normal, self-evident, even if now people don't understand it. My dear friend, Ray Kurzweil, who also writes in the book, he talks about the three bridges to immortality in his book, Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever. And he talks about reaching longevity scale velocity between the year 2029 and 2030. So if we reach 2030 alive, we will gain one year per year we survive. So we will be living longer and longer, even if it's still aging, even if it's still aging until 2045, when we will be able to rejuvenate. He just sent me the latest version of his manuscript of his new book coming out in June, The Singularities Nearer, which is a continuation of 20 years ago, The Singularities Near. And he keeps his two dates, longevity escape velocity by 2029-30 and immortality through biological rejuvenation at the latest by the year 2045 because of the convergence of all these technologies, nano, bio, info, cogno, actually, we will be immortal not just once. We will be immortal twice. We will be immortal on the hardware side, and we will be immortal also on the software side. We will be able to read and copy our minds if we want. So we will be biologically and computationally immortal by 2045. All companies are beginning to understand that this is real, Google created Calico about 10 years ago, California Life Company. Um, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan are donating all his fortune, well, 99%, uh, to cure all diseases, including aging in this generation. Uh, and uh, if you prefer uh, Microsoft, Microsoft plans to solve cancer. Now that we can sequence the genome, we will find the mutations that stop aging in cancer cells. And Tim Cook, Apple, also says that Apple will be remembered, but what they will do in health, in health. And of course, uh, we have Amazon, Jeff Bezos, who is investing with other people $3 billion in Altos Labs, which is doing epigenetic reprogramming. Uh, in fact, this market is growing fast. It's going to be the biggest market in the planet, over $8 trillion in longevity. And this is growing exponentially. It begins with millions, now it's at billions, soon it will be trillions. And this will be the biggest industry in the planet. Also, it will be a positive industry because there, be, there will be something call, called the longevity dividend. Longevity dividend. Being young is better, also economically, than being old. So there will be actually a superavit, a fiscal superavit, no a, no a fiscal deficit once we cure aging. And as I mentioned, what is happening right now, financed also par partially by countries like uh, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, etc., cetera, is, is incredible. Even in the Middle East, they have discovered that aging can be stopped, that aging can be reversed, and they are working towards it. This, this price will change many things. And remember, the goal is 2030, to rejuvenate people between 65 and 80 at least 10 years by 2030. I don't know if it will happen, but the results, the research, the information we will gain will be absolutely fantastic. And the same, I repeat, in Dubai and many other countries. Last year, we invited to Spain the Nobel Prize in Medicine of 2012, Shinja Yamanaka. Uh, you can see Shinja Yamanaka, he is one of the leaders of Altos Labs, uh, which is the investment that Jeff Bezos, Yuri Milner, and other millionaires made. And he's working on epigenetic reprogramming. And we are convincing him to open the fifth Altos Lab Center in Madrid. And why Madrid? Because 20% of the scientists working in Altos are from Spain. One out of every five scientists. Only after Americans. Americans, then Spanish, and then British. 
So a lot of research has been doing on epigenetic reprogramming. Also, I explained this is fundamental. Today, we know that aging is reversible. There is even a Nobel Prize, and people don't know it. To me, this is absolutely frustrating that people don't know that we can reverse aging. And there are people who are doing this, like um, my friend, he was at MIT before, now he's at Harvard, uh, David Sinclair, who is uh, actually turning back time. That was the, the top, um, the cover article in Nature magazine when he, uh, his students, his lab people, actually were able to rejuvenate the eyes of mice. They took mice that were about 80 human years, and they were basically blind. And through a gene therapy with the Yamanaka factors, they regained their sight. Their eyes went back to age 20, from age 80 to age 20. And now, this has been replicated not only with mice, with monkeys. And in Japan, they are beginning to do this also with humans, with humans. I'm pretty sure we will be curing most eye diseases in the next few years. So my goal, as I said, is to kill death before death kills us, to be younger. And so I plan to be younger in the future, not through a Russian application like FaceApp. No, no, I plan to be younger because I am committed, like I hope most of you, to biological rejuvenation. The goal is biological rejuvenation. And we will keep on evolving. Humans have not finished evolving. We will continue evolving. But we have to do it carefully, carefully. Humans have existed only 200,000 years. We are really nothing, nothing in the evolution of life in this planet. We are, however, probably the end of simple biological evolution and the beginning of sophisticated, complex technological evolution. So this is an incredible thing we are going to see, but this is very complex, so we have to meditate. I love meditation, different types of meditation. And uh, as the Chinese say, there is yin and yang. This is very complex. There is always yin and yang. So it's so complex that yin yang inside has little yin yang. And little yin yang has little, little yin yang. So also the Chinese say, let's light up the world. Don't blame darkness. The problem is not that we don't know. Uh, the opportunity is what we will discover. We need to light up a candle to illuminate the world. And I lived three years in Japan, and I went a lot to South Korea. And sadly, there is also North Korea. North Korea is, is a very poor country, as you can see, not illuminated, and with no public internet. It's the last country in the planet without public internet. While South Korea is the most illuminated country with the best internet in Asia. In Asia. So where do we want to go? To the future or to the past? We have the two possibilities there, going the way of South Korea or the way of North Korea extending to the past. And I want to basically finish with this beautiful Chinese word that means crisis, crisis in Chinese. First, I wrote it upside down or sideways. Now I know how to write it, crisis. The first character means danger, danger. But the second character means opportunity. We are living in the most incredible times of human history. We are going to see more technological advances in the next 20 years than in the last 2,000 years. I repeat, more advances in the next two decades than in the last two millennia. We have seen nothing yet of what technology is going to advance. We are between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. So where do you want to be? You want to be one of the last stupid people who die? Or one of the first intelligent people who overcomes aging? So come to Anaheim for revolution against aging and death. Uh, come tomorrow to Miami. I'm presenting my book in uh, Books and Books in Coral Gables at 6 PM. And of course, read the book in any language. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We have time for a few questions. Jose, thank you very much for that. The first question is going to come from online. We have a number of people watching, and the question is, uh, what assessments have you made of the Blueprint Project promoted by Brian Johnson? What are your thoughts on that? Well, fantastic. We actually, as I mentioned, Brian Johnson went to Vitalia in Honduras, and he got injected with folistatin, among other 
um, therapies. And also we, we followed his protocol. Uh, the, people, the 200 people who are in this experiment, the city of immortality, Vitalia, uh, were following this protocol. I think it is uh, something that works, but it is actually very demanding uh, and also still somewhat expensive. Uh, but I think it is a, a good beginning, a good beginning. I love biohackers. Actually, I do some biohacking myself. I, I think this is good. Then we can discover things. But uh, diets are not the same. You know, he has a very strict diet. But that diet is not necessarily good for everybody because we have different organisms. Actually, um, also diets for women are not similar to diets for men sometimes. So it is a good example. I love what he's doing. He's actually breaking ground on this biohacking world, and he's putting millions of dollars of his own money. So I uh, actually applaud what he's doing. OK, we have a question back here. And here we go. Where was the question? Yes, go ahead, David. Yeah, hi, Doc. Uh, very much uh, appreciated your presentation. Um, I almost yelled out when you were going through all the number one problems in the world with the pandemics and disease and global warming. Uh, well, I want to get your opinion on plastics, the latest uh, number one problem, plastics, and how do we address that? Um, well, I think we are going to solve um, most problems we have today. If we go back in history, when Malthus, Malthus said it was the end of the world two centuries ago, when London had one million people, and the Thames River was truly polluted, contaminated, and people had cholera in the streets of London. And thanks to technology, Thanks to science, uh, we don't have cholera in London. The Thames River is clean again. There are fish and dogs in the Thames River. So I think we are going to solve all these problems also about plastic and so on and so forth. But again, something which is very important to keep in mind. In the USA, 90% of the people die of age-related diseases. 90%. Only 10% die of non age-related diseases, and that includes plastics, global warming, the Russians, uh, religion, accidents, uh, suicides, uh, AIDS, malaria, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are only 10%. Jose, I have a question from John back here. Thanks again, Doc. Fantastic presentation. Um, my question uh, has to do with um, what, do you, what are your thoughts? You've given us a very optimistic timeline on the uh, overcoming of biological disease and aging. As it pertains to what you just mentioned, accidental death, that's personal to me because I've got a two-hour drive on I-95 <laughs> after the meeting tonight. And, and what are your thoughts on the timeline for overcoming trauma-induced death at this point? Um, well, talking about the optimistic... Um, um, forecast. Actually, in the book, I have forecast with my friend Ray Kurzweil until the year 2099, which is quite interesting to read in the appendix. What will happen in science and technology to the year 2099? I just came from uh, Naples uh, uh, to be here. I went to visit the Fountain Life Clinic, so I also had a long drive. And um, I don't like driving anymore. Uh, because in Madrid, you don't need to drive. When I lived in California, I had to drive, and it is a pain in the neck. Now, I think we are going to have self-driving cars very soon. So technology will actually um, be doing most of the driving, and I trust more technology than me. Also, because if I'm tired, if I'm sleepy, if I'm drunk, you know, I don't want to drive. I let my car drive. So anyway, so my point is that uh, technology will solve many of these problems, like what you are saying, or like the plastics issue. All of these problems we will solve, like we have been doing for two centuries. Uh, I don't know if that answers, but uh, well, I am an engineer, so I believe in the power of science and technology. Thank you, Jose. Here's a question back here from Bree. Hello. I'm going to say it in English, but I am from Venezuela, so I can say it in Spanish too. OK. It's very nice, but w do we have to wait until 2045 or something? Do you have something for us now? Um, well, first, fantastic question. And also, the future is really not written. Um, these are the forecasts mostly from uh, Ray Kurzweil, even though I also take some numbers for some extrapolation from Elon Musk, British Telecom, and some other groups that make forecasts. I try to compile all of, the, all of those, including the United Nations in terms of population. But in terms of the dates, 
uh, for 2045 uh, for biological rejuvenation. Of course, I want it to happen sooner. And you know why? Because every day, 110,000 people die of age-related diseases. Every day, yesterday, 110,000 people. Today, another 110,000 people died because of age-related diseases. So this is the elephant in the room. It is not plastic. It is not driving. It is not the Russians. The enemy is aging. So I want more people to be involved. That is why I am devoting all my time to communicate this and, and to help with governments and to help with social groups and to, to work also with companies, with startups, with universities. Because if we accelerate the process, it could happen earlier. So I want this to happen earlier. If you get involved, it will happen probably earlier, maybe in 2035. You know, to me, as an engineer, this is a technical problem. We, ho we know as a fact that there are immortal animals. We know as a fact that there are immortal cells. We know it. We don't have to create or to pray. No, no, no. There are immortal cells. And cancer discovered immortality on its own without reading. So it is a matter of time until we understand this procedure. And the more people are involved, the sooner it will happen. But I understand your question. What can we do now? Uh, Ray, um, Ray Kurzweil talks about the three bridges to immortality. It is in the book, chapter five. In those three chapters, the first chapter is do what your mother told you. Eat well, sleep, do exercise, try not to smoke or drink too much, etc., etc. That's bridge one, until last decade, the 2010s. Now, in the 2020s, we have the first biotechnology therapies. Things like senolytics, like rapamycin, uh, maybe metformin are coming up now in this decade. Uh, Foliestatin, which is what Brian Johnson injected himself in biology, because the human genome, remember, is three gigabytes. And our brains are too limited to understand these three gigabytes. But artificial intelligence helps us. So artificial intelligence will be the final point to cure aging. But again, now you are in between bridge one and bridge two. So do all your mother told you, and also do the first um, biotechnology therapies. And Bill Falun is an expert. And the Life Extension magazine is fantastic. If you are not members of the Life Extension Foundation, I get my products from the Life Extension Foundation. I recommend that to everybody. And to read the Life Extension magazine. They have fantastic articles about senolytics, about metformin, about rapamycin, about many things that are new. And some of them already happily approved in the USA or go to other places. You know, I love competition. If the USA stays behind, someone will do it. Thank you, Jose. And actually, Bree, uh, we have a speaker coming in a minute who's going to also address what you can do now. I have a question back here with Mary Alice. Again, thank you for coming this evening. My question is, this is all wonderful and sounds great, but how do you get big pharmaceutical companies on board? Well, uh, you don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually think this is a total disruption. And the disruption comes from outside, not from inside. And actually, one of the big problems is the pharmaceutical companies. They prefer to have you eternally sick than eternally healthy. So, and also the FDA. The FDA is a big problem. The Food and Drug Administration is so slow, so bureaucratic, and there are so many vested interests that it is a problem. That is why we need international competition. But now, individuals are disrupting the medical sector. Just like Elon Musk disrupted the, uh, the transportation sector, you know, the electric car was not invented by Elon Musk. General Motors had electric cars, and then they eliminated them. They didn't want to compete with their own gasoline cars. So the disruption didn't come from General Motors. It came from Elon Musk. The disruption to space travel is also coming from Elon Musk, from Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, with um, Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic. So the disruption comes from outside. And the pharmaceuticals are going to be disrupted. And, and this is already happening. Many startups, many small companies are growing incredibly fast because they are truly solving the problems. And this is unstoppable. When a small group of people, when a small startup uh, managed to cure cancer or cure Alzheimer's, forget about the pharmaceuticals. These companies will have the cure and people will take it. 
Great, Jeff. Jose, here's a question from Jeff. I saw that chart you had, that evolutionary chart, and I was wondering, uh, do you believe that human beings evolved from uh, a one-celled organism in the sea three million years ago, as many people believe, many scientists believe? Well, all the biological data goes that way. When you look at the genome, you look at the genome of uh, the animal species, uh, you can see when we actually separated from monkeys. Our separation from our monkey ancestor was about eight million years ago. The apparition of mammals, mammals appeared about a hundred uh, million years ago. Um, we were actually in the sea before life appeared on the sea. And we can see the evolution of the genome. And also when the, the trees, the plants separated from animals, all of this can be tracked through the genome. The genome has all the information of you and your ancestors. So, so yes, I believe in that because that is what science tells us today. If something is discovered later, I am open-minded. But today, to me, there is very little doubt that we come from monkeys and monkeys come from other mammals and mammals come from other animals and we all come from tiny bacteria who were immortal, by the way. Those first bacteria, don't forget that, were biologically immortal. They had run chromosomes with no telomeres. They, life appeared to live, not to die. Jose, we have one more question from the internet, and that is, what do you personally do to reverse your aging? Is there one or two things you can say that you do for yourself? Uh, yes, I am, uh, as you can see, 161. <laughs> Uh, and I plan to celebrate my 200th anniversary on planet Mars. So all welcome to Mars. Okay, no, seriously, what do I do? Uh, and I have uh, 61 years old. Uh, I was born in 1962, soon to be 62. Anyway, um, what do I do? I do bridge one and bridge two uh, things. So bridge one, what my mother told me, you know, eat well, sleep well, or at least try to, uh, to do some exercise, not to drink, not to smoke, etc., etc. And then I take the first biotechnology therapies. As I mentioned, I buy many products from the Life Extension Foundation. I buy uh, Coenzyme Q10, I buy NAD uh, Plus precursors, I buy uh, multivitamins, uh, multiminerals, uh, I buy um, uh, um, metformin, uh, many, many things that you can buy. Uh, also, Xenolytics. Xenolytics are beginning to come, and then Life Extension Foundation has also Xenolytics. So, uh, I will be actually tomorrow in the Life Extension Foundation to buy some, some bottles of things that I want for me and for my family, because this is what we can do now in this second bridge to immortality. Then we will have third bridge, nanotechnology, and then we will have immortality with uh, artificial intelligence at least by the year 2045. So yes, you need to stay alive. Please, as Brian Johnson says, don't die, don't die. And my friend Charlie Cam actually has been saying that for a long time, and as you will see now. Uh, so don't die, because also Ray Kurzweil says, just hang in there until 2030. Because if you leave it un until 2030, you will basically live long enough to live forever because we will be living one year longer per year we survive after 2030. So don't die, please, that's my advice. Ladies and gentlemen, Jose Cordero. Thank you, Jose, wonderful job. We're excited now to bring up Charlie Cam, the well-known transhumanist movie producer. Some of you may remember Charlie from last October when he introduced Ray Kurzweil to give his talk. So uh, let's go ahead and welcome Charlie, who is the president of the board of here at the Church of Perpetual Life, Charlie Cam. Okay, Charlie. You. <clears throat> you know, in, uh, in 2020, I ran for president. Uh, I was the nominee for uh, the United States Transhumanist Party. And um, my understanding that one of the candidates claims that the election was stolen, so I might be president. Um, but if I'm not, I am very honored to be uh, the president of the, of the board of directors of the Church of Perpetual Life. I really uh, thank you, uh, Bill Falloon and uh, Neil Vandery and the, um, and the whole board for putting me in that position. My goal is to uh, try to bring really 
interesting, great guests that are going to talk about life extension. As you mentioned, I was able to get Ray Kurzweil to come back, you know, come down here in in October, and you know, he's he's one of those guys that really knows a lot of stuff about life extension. Um, but I'm really excited to be uh, down here tonight, also to support my very good friend Jose Cordero. Uh, his book is really amazing. It's called The Death of Death, as you probably well as you heard, and. Uh, Coincidentally, uh, not really, um, the, the music video I'm about to show has actually got the same title, Death of Death, and it is based on some of the things that, uh, or one of the things that uh, Jose talks about in his book. Uh, so it is dedicated to Jose, but it's also an, an, an homage to a very famous um, foreign film that was uh, released in 1957 in this country um, by Ingmar Bergman, who's considered one of the greatest directors of all times, and the film is, um, it's based on the idea that this, uh, this knight, in the, like in the, it was around 1300 or so, he, he had come back from the Crusades. Uh, he, he was from Sweden, he was coming back, and, and uh, you know, the Crusades, by the way, just so you can reflect on the fact that history can repeat itself from times to time to time. The Crusades lasted from 1100 to 1300, about 200 years, and they were fighting over two different religions that were fighting over um, the occupation of uh, religious uh, or, 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 or uh, holy lands in the Middle East. So, you know, <laughs> you would think we would learn from things. Um, anyway, he came back to Sweden, and by the way, in the Crusades, people, there were about six million people or so died which was devastating at the time because the population was much lower. So he came back from the Crusades, he comes, and he's already doubting the existence of God because he's thinking all this cruelty. And, and he finds out that, as Jose had mentioned, the bubonic plague was already ravaging all of Europe and, and the world. About 25 million people in Europe had ex died from the bubonic plague, but worldwide, the, the numbers are estimated anywhere from 75 million to up to 200 million. It was really hard to keep track back then. But here he was, really devastated. He was miserable about it. He didn't know whether there was a God, whether he should exist. It was a very, the film was really well crafted and it was about existentialism. But anyway, he's walking down the beach and he sees this figure coming at him and he's looking at it and he realizes it's, it's what he knows as death. It's the, it's, you know, it's the guy with the, it's the death figure with the hood and the, and the Sith and he's walking at him and he's walking towards the night and and the knight realizes he's coming for him. So the knight doesn't want to die. This is back in 1300. The knight doesn't want to die. We don't want, nobody wants to die. So he's, he's, he thinks, well, I, I, I'm going to challenge, I'm going to challenge death to a, a game of chess because maybe there's a way I can keep alive if I can win or I can do something. Well, this is, that was the 1300s. And of course, even if he won or whatever, there really was no technology. I mean, and, and by the way, this film was released in 1957. And uh, even the director, as I mentioned, he, when, when, when um, Ingmar Bergman wrote this, he had the same kind of thoughts about, you know, like, well, there's really no way out of life. This is miserable. We're, we're here, then we die, and we're gone. But what's exciting <laughs> are the fact that we're all here now where we do have this opportunity to not have to die. So, and that's what's great about Jose's book. You really got to read his book, please. Uh, it's just a fascinating coverage of all the ways we can keep going. And so when I made this film, what I did was I basically took the concept that, that Ingmar did in that film, and I kind of tweaked it around to show you the version that makes sense for now and why we might not have to have the same miserable fate that the poor knight... Uh, his name was uh, Antonius Block, was the name of that character. So anyway, uh, that's good. Please, Doug, show the, the video. I hope you guys enjoy it. I asked my grandmother, where did grandfather go? And she replied. Child. That's where we all will go when we get old. We all must die. Mm -hmm. 
But things are different now Science has changed it all And getting old is a fallacy There's a new lease on life So if tragedy strikes And things are at the worst they'll ever be We can try one thing more When death is right at the door We can preserve ourselves Bionically Don't know if it works for sure yet But it's a much smarter bet Giving yourself a plan B So I say Have you can wait for another day Stop a thing to go away Have you can wait for another day Let death be a holiday I saw the news today so many times disease They buried all the dead While I thought in my head These tragedies Don't have to be Things are different now Science has changed it all And being buried is a travesty Now we don't have to go We'll just be put on hold And realize this new reality We'll freeze them and then we'll store them Until we find a cure for them then they can return to my future advanced society. Now I'm thinking we'll live forever. The chances are much, much better. Approaching immortality. One more time. I think we for another day. Stop a thing. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you again. Wow. Let's bring up our next speaker. What a great film. We appreciate that in all of your films. Our next speaker is the founder of this church and the founder of numerous organizations, always on the cutting edge of age reversal, here to give us another an age reversal update, Mr. Bill Falloon. Bill, welcome. I'm going to bring you news literally from the front lines of biomedical research that we are working on, we being charitable groups, these are non-commercial enterprises that are set up to advance research fast enough so that everyone here can benefit. The problem with commercial companies is they want to patent their IP and they want to divvy up the ownership of the IP and go through all kind of formalities. That can take years and most of us don't have that kind of time to wait. So we prefer the nonprofit route to energizing research so that we can live longer. So this is a little bit of a science lesson, but I want people to pay attention so you fully understand what's going on literally right now on the front lines. Transcription factors are proteins that can turn on or turn off genes, genes in our DNA that control our cells. And if we put the right transcription factors in, 
we put the right ones in, we can reprogram old cells back into stem cells or young cells, reprogram those in a way that we regenerate our tissues indefinitely. And there were about 1,500 genetic transcription factors that we know about. We know about this, and just a few of them have remarkable effects. Yamanaka transcription factors have been proven to reprogram old cells back into induced pluripotent stem cells or just young adult cells. Either one is fantastic, and these young cells can theoretically divide in a healthy way forever. This is the research that's being aggressively pursued. Now, the original Yamanaka factors, there were four of them. On the left are the acronyms for those, OCT4, SOX2, KLL4, CMYK, and then on the right, you can see what those stand for, octamere binding protein, SR white box factor, Koopa-like factor. These are the Yamanaka four factors, that's OSKM. You're gonna see that more and more talked about in the media, talked about in scientific papers, and you're gonna wonder, what does that mean, OSKM? Well, that refers to four Yamanaka factors that were able to reverse aging in a Petri dish and in live mice. Those four, when introduced into cells or live animals, puts aging in reverse. But what you're gonna see more often now is only three out of four of these Yamanaka factors. It turns out that three out of four of them may work better than all four of them put together, and it may be a lot safer. So we're looking ma mainly at OSK right now as the way to rejuvenate our cells and rejuvenate our entire bodies. So this is an, an example of how these Yamanaka factors work. I'm going to go through this relatively slow, and I hope everyone can understand what we are doing on the front lines of biomedical research to rejuvenate old mice, then old monkeys, and we believe by year 2025, we may be able to experiment with very old people. And we've got people standing in line who want these and are reminding me that they're primates also. And I'm just not gonna let anyone suffer an injury. We have to do the mice and the monkeys first. So you have on top there the four Yamanaka transcription factors. Well, the first step is we need to deliver these inside of cells. If we don't get them inside of cells, they're not going to have that rejuvenating effect occur. So we deliver those via a number of different methods, which I'm gonna talk about. But we get those Yamanaka factors delivered inside of old cells. We get them divided uh, or introduced delivered into these old cells, and what that does is it reprograms old cells back into induced pluripotent stem cells. Those stem cells are then capable of differentiating into tissue-specific progenitor cells to theoretically regenerate any organ system or every organ system. This is one way that Yamanaka factors can do that. Now, I hope that's clear to people. We've got these proteins called Yamanaka factors. They're available for sale at research laboratories, not for you to buy. They're available for sale for scientists to do research on. And I've had people try to contact these companies and they could kill themselves. So please do not buy these from research companies. We're using them in the laboratory in mice and soon to be primates to see if we can introduce them into cells to let people, or the monkeys at least, live indefinitely. So this is one way of making Yamanaka factors work inside an organism, let it turn into a stem cell, and that stem cell produces lots of young cells. But there may be a more efficient way to making that happen, something more efficient, and that is let's directly convert that young old cell back into a younger cell. It's known as partial reprogramming because if we put in all of the transcription factors that are available to an embryo, and these Yamanaka factors are heavily expressed in embryos, it lets them develop very, very quickly. This method might be more efficient, and that is deliver the Yamanaka factors into the old cell so that it goes and turns into a young cell without even needing a stem cell to be produced. And this could enable young, healthy cells to remain young, healthy cells by intermittently expressing three out of the four Yamanaka factors, the OSK, Inter intermittently introducing these back and forth, maintaining youthful cell structure and cell functionality for perhaps an indefinite period of time. 
This is the research we are working on, and some of the key areas that we're focusing is five or six different ways of delivering these Jaminaka factors to the cells so that we can systemically reverse aging in our bodies. And this is happening right now in laboratories throughout the world. Some of the charitable groups I'm working with, I'd like to think, might win this rate race, but this is a race that we don't mind losing, by the way. If someone else discovers a way to make us grow younger, that's fine. I don't mind spending the money. So what happens when you deliver, effectively, Yamanaka factors into old mice? Well, most of you know already, because I've talked about it before. It reverses aging, systemically, in old mice. Old mice grow biologically younger. They behave biologically younger. This has made headline news around the world that if you introduce Yamanaka factors the right way into old mice, they grow biologically younger. You reverse their aging process. Most systems go in reverse. We're that close to that happening. This was a, it announced, by the way, by the Salk Institute, March 2022, and they were able to do that partial cell reprogramming, just reverse aging a little bit and then get rather spectacular factors. They used the OSKM, Yamanaka transcription factors, that's all four of them, and all four of them were found to yield better benefits when they were expressed more often, and they didn't find any toxicity or increase in cancer. That was good news. There were concerns raised about that. In this study, no problems. They were able to rejuvenate these older mice using OSKM, and they could see younger looking skin, more skin cell division, lower inflammation, reduced senescent associated secretory phenotype, but no data collected on lifespan, which we're a little disappointed. But the fact is, this is the first time systemic administration of Yamanaka factors reverse biological aging in a mouse. So we were impressed by this, but we were looking for some data. Uh, we liked the fact that the skin, kidneys, different organ systems in those mice were growing younger, but were they really living longer? Well, Harvard did some research on Yamanaka factors. They, too, were able to reverse epigenetic aging. This made headline news around the world that Harvard was also using Yamanaka transcription factors to put aging in reverse. And CNN was saying, well, if you can do this to mice, why don't, why don't we do this to humans? And of course, that's our question. We want to accelerate that research, and our groups are doing that on a charitable basis. This is a nonprofit effort, and we can move ahead faster that way as opposed to companies forming and investors putting money in and complaining if you're not making money fast enough. We're looking for progress, not to make the money. But again, no data collected on lifespan. But then a third study. Oh, this is all done in the year 2022, published in 2023. This research group achieved the cellular reprogramming using transcription factors, but they also extended remaining lifespan over 100%. The mice appeared younger, and they lived a lot longer. And what they did with this group is they took rather old mice, elderly mice, and they gave them the Yamanaka factors, the OSK. They only used three out of four of them. And what they were able to find is it more than doubled the remaining lifespan. And that's critical, because most of us, we don't have a lot of life left as it relates to what we're seeking to achieve. So we want to extend our remaining lifespan. We don't want to learn that if young mice are given Yamanaka factors, they live to be 300. We're not young anymore. We need to find therapies that will, well, treat our frailty and extend our remaining lifespan. We already know now that this can be done. We're working with these scientists in a way to duplicate, emulate this, improve it, and then move into the primate model. So what they did to deliver those Yamanaka factors into the cell, they used an adeno-associated virus that was encoded with the three out of four Yamanaka factors, OSK, and the mice were injected, essentially infected with this virus that then encoded their DNA with Yamanaka factors that could be turned on and off with doxycycline, and well, they reversed epigenetic age markers, they restored youthful functionality, and they they extended remaining lifespan over 109%. We need to extend our remaining lifespan 109% if we're going to make it to that point of immortality. In this chart I've shown before, typical 77-year-old, you're in good health, you've got a good chance of making it to 87. If these Yamanaka factors work in people the way they did in mice, we extend that window an extra 10 
years. Instead of dying at 87, we can make it to about 98. And if we can live that long, we're there for the singularity. We're there for that year 2030, year 2040, 2045, when humans will become immortal. A lot of us in this room, unfortunately, are too old to benefit now. But if these Yamanaka factors work, we're going to reverse aging, give us longer time to be around in order to achieve these incredible benefits. So the history of cellular re reprogramming using transcription factors, 2006, the impossible occurred. In a petri dish, they reversed aging. They brought old cells right back at down into the embryonic stage. And well, 2000, let me go back to that uh, slide if I can. Uh, we have 2006, they did it for the first time, they did it with human cells, 2011, the whole genome of the humans sequenced in 2000. 2022, 2022, aging is partially reversed in live mice in three independent studies. And I really want to emphasize the value of confirmatory research. We're going to do the same research that they did to see if we can emulate it, and then we want to improve that in our laboratory. And what our goals are, and this is a major announcement, 2024, we intend to do primate research to take dilapidated, decrepit, senescent old monkeys and hopefully restore youthful functionality to them through all kind of biological measurements and observe them. See if some old monkey gets up and starts behaving like a young monkey. And by 2025, if those old monkeys grow biologically younger, we've got people who are begging us can I try some Yamanaka factors? Well, we're going to try them a year 2025 if the monkey research works out well to see if we can put aging in reverse. Some people were expressing concern that maybe they're too old to benefit from what Jose was talking about. We may not be. We may be only two or three years away from putting aging in reverse using these transcription factors. But guess what? Everything I just told you about Yamanaka factors, it's radically improved. Now, we've known about this for the last year at the Max Planck, Planck Institute and other prestigious university. They're taking Yamanaka factors, they're combining them, they're doing different types of maneuvers with them to make them work much better. And what they're doing is they're producing higher quality stem cells, higher quality younger cells in response to using this next level of super socks. This is an upgrade to Yamanaka factors, which people have been fascinated with now since 2006. They've already made them better. And we are buying these upgraded Yamanaka factors to test very rapidly in mice and then in primates. And then by 2025, if everything goes well, we may be doing it with people. What they were able to do by upgrading the, the effects of the Yamanaka factors, well, enhanced generation of the stem cells uh, in five different species. And that's very important, because for many people, they want to see these Yamanaka factors transform old cells into healthy young stem cells to produce lots and lots of healthy progenitor cells to regenerate our tissues. They improved stem cell quality, and they improved the number of naive stem cells. And for people who don't understand this concept, a stem cell starts out naive, and then it differentiates into all kind of different cells. But at some point, we run out of naive stem cells. There's nothing left. And once we are totally depleted of stem cells, we die. We don't produce red blood cells, immune cells, platelets. Our bone marrow basically gives out on us. This is a way to restore bone marrow youthful functionality in a way that we produce limitless supplies of naive stem cells. And this could be a universal method in order to reprogram our bodies to grow as young as we choose to go. Now, this is a little bit of an explanation. These are called super socks. What they did is they combined SOX2 and OC4 into a compound that reprogrammed more efficiently than putting them in separately. So they were able to improve the quality, the development of the existing pluripotent stem cells in the body. And for the first time, they were able to produce induced pluripotent stem cells that were so developmentally competent, developmentally competent, that they could easily give rise to a whole new person. That is spectacular to think about. They can be that potent. This is brand new. You can see the publication date, January 4th, 2024. And for some people, maybe you took a little bit of a break around the holidays. We did not. You can check our emails. We were going back and forth with the idea that we can now buy these from the Max Planck Institute and do research. We've known about them for the last year and a half. But they said, until we publish, you're not going to be able to use them. And now we're able to. We've got an order placed. They're not cheap hundreds of thousands of dollars, but this again is critical. 
improved Yamanaka factors to do even better than what we had expected. Now, this is the title of the paper. It looks like almost it's written in a foreign language. Unless you are a geneticist, you really don't understand all these acronyms. You don't understand what you're talking about. So I try to make it simple. And again, to emphasize how complex this is, which is exciting, this is just a summary of a 25,000 word article. It was like a book. And this is highly dense technical information about genetics and using different types of Yamanaka factor combinations to improve the outcomes. So that when I read these papers, I get much more excited than seeing a news media headline saying aging reversed in mice. You wonder, is that hype? Is it really something that can work in people? When you read these papers, you realize how far advanced the scientific community is in achieving cellular reprogramming, cellular rejuvenation, systemic immortality. So getting the Yamanaka factors into cells, that's a little bit of a challenge, though it's doable with an adeno-associated virus. Uh, the virus essentially is encoded with the transcription factors. It then infects our cells and then infects our cells with Yamanaka factors and super socks, the super Yamanaka factors, put those into our body. So if you see at the bottom, you see the AA V9 vector, that's the adeno-associated viral vector. Uh, that is the gold standard right now. That's what we'll be giving this to a lot of mice and primates, because we know this works. And by the way, AAV delivery of gene therapies, it's been used in hundreds and hundreds of human studies. It's considered very safe. But we'd like to look at even safer ways. So we're looking at mini circle DNA plasmids, lipid nano particles. We're looking at different ways to deliver these Yamanaka factors into your cells so that you get the optimal benefit with a minimal amount of side effect risk. So we'll be studying all of these delivery methods that you see in the bottom to introduce these Yamanaka factors into mice, primates, i.e. monkeys, and people within the next two years. That's our game plan right now to defeat aging in our lifetime. And for some of us here, we don't have that much more time to live. So to remember what these transcription factors do, you're going to see this word used more and more. They turn on specific genes. And you don't want them to turn on bad genes, uh, like BRCA1, you know, a cancer gene, or APOE4, which is an Alzheimer's gene. You want those genes turned off. Well, these transcription factors are eventually going to turn off those bad genes turn on the good ones, like P53, that'll prevent cancer, that'll prevent a lot of different disorders from occurring. So transcription factors, and they're working with them right now, they've been doing it for the last decade or so, they can enable old cells to be reprogrammed into stem or healthy young adult cells. It's like a light switch. We've got that type of control over aging. Back in 2019, 2020, uh, a study was published. I helped to fund a study. And by the way, you can't really see it, but Jose, he's on that study right now, along with a number of scientists that we work with right now, scientists that we are helping to support, because the community was not moving fast enough. I mean, Dr. Yamanaka reversed aging in 2006 in the Petri dish, won a Nobel Prize in 2012, and here it is 2019, 2020, we're saying, well, what the heck, what's going on here? So we published this study to emphasize the benefits of using Yamanaka factors to reverse aging. And other publications came out too, showing really just beautiful graphics. This type of uh, technology involves removing from your blood, uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and then transforming them using Yamanaka factors into young cells and putting them back in the body. And I'm going to explain how we do that uh, with this graphic here. Uh, we start off with an old person, terrible situation to be in. So we remove either blood or fibroblast, either one. We, put, we take those cells and start multiplying them in a Petri dish. And then we add the Yamanaka and other transcription factors to those cells from our own body. They're autologous cells, meaning we won't reject them. And then we can take those cells, differentiate them into tissue-specific progenitor cells. We can purify those very carefully, meticulously purify them, make sure they're all good cells, put them back into the old person's body, and theoretically rejuvenate that person on a systemic basis. That's another way of using Yamanaka factors. That is taking your cells out of your body, rejuvenating them back to youth, and putting them back in. The other method, as I discussed, is putting the Yamanaka factors directly into your old cells and let your body do the rejuvenating itself. We may actually do a combination. We may do this therapy in order to boost the amount of young cells in the body and then use the other technique where we, we inject the Yamanaka factors in to further engage in age reversal. 
further enabled more age reversal to occur. And I've shown this slide before, but I'll show you it again just to remind you how simple it may be to live a lot longer. CAT7 is one of these drivers of cellular senescence. This is a gene. They use CRISPR to knock out the CAT7 gene, to silence it. And they extended lifespan in normal age mice, 25%. They improved the overall appearance, the grip strength. This was just taking one gene using CRISPR, knocking it out, and the animals live a lot longer. What we're talking about with transcription factors plus enhanced CRISPR, modulating all of our genes, optimizing our genetic profile the way your cell phone, hopefully, is optimized so it works most of the time. We want to see that happen. And if that just simple genetic manipulation works the same in people as it did in this animal model, well, 25% lifespan extension, that gets us from a, a 78 average lifespan uh, up to about 98 average years. If we can live that long, most of us will be alive to be there for the singularity. When man, machine merge, we get to live forever way beyond biology. Front page of the Wall Street Journal, December 2023, CRISPR, you heard about that in this church, 2014, 2015. It's approved to treat the disease sickle cell anemia. Uh, and then also, January, a month later, FDA approves a second CRISPR therapy to treat a disease that causes severe anemia in people. So we've got the CRISPR that was in the laboratory in 2015. It's moved into the clinical setting. We're seeing what we preach at this church transforming into clinical reality in our lifetime. So they were able to use CRISPR to take care of a genetic problem in a way that this is just going to disappear. The way smallpox and other diseases disappeared, these genetic therapies are going to enable us to achieve, well, what this publication talked about. Uh, George Church, of course, is a pioneer of CRISPR technology, and they're asking, you know, is he playing God with our genes? And I say, well, heck yeah, that's exactly what he is doing. He's doing what the creator intended for mankind to do, and that is develop technologies that will transform us from where we are now, and that is mortals, into an era of perpetual abundance, perpetual life. And the media is starting to recognize we're playing around with technology that people never imagined could ever be done before. It's happening before our eyes. So I want to thank everyone for showing up. I love January. Lots of people show up, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Bill? Uh, regarding mice, were they artificially aged before the Yamanaka factors reduced the aging? And whether, if so, w whether the non-artificially aged mice had similar outcomes? I don't think they were artificially aged, but I don't know the exact answer. What we do with our research is we buy old mice, and they cost a lot of money. An, an old mouse costs about $300 each. Uh, a, a young mouse is like nothing. But, uh, so normally, the scientists look at normally aged mice so they can replicate what normally aged people go through. OK, we have a question here from John. Hi, Bill. Um, if I'm to believe my lying eyes, I just thought I saw a slide about doxycycline having a be beneficial effect on Yamanaka factors, and I was wondering if you might be able to just briefly speak to the synolytic effects or the Yamanaka-inducing effects of certain antibiotics. Yeah, some people are taking a doxycycline treatment uh, once a year uh, to clear out excess bacteria in their blood and to just recalibrate their intestinal flora and then get on a good probiotic to optimize their flora. In other words, some people can take a lot of probiotics, but you get a lot of bad bacteria in your gut anyway. So some people, I'm not recommending this to everyone, but I'm just saying some enlightened individuals realize if I get rid of the bacteria and then put in beneficial bacteria, I may likely have a lot more good bacteria than bad. Doxycycline, though, in these studies is being used as a triggering agent to turn on the expression of the Yamanaka factor. Remember, these are proteins. You get them inside of cells. Well, something's going to say, turn on. And they simply use doxycycline as a triggering agent. We very well could develop other triggering agents that does not rely on doxycycline. But those researchers used doxycycline, and it worked. Question here from Jeff. Yes, I'm curious. Exactly what are the Yamanaka factors? I mean, is it a, a liquid, or, or what is it, and how is it obtained? OK, these are proteins that are synthesized. They, they're found in the embryonic stage. They're highly expressed naturally. So these aren't anything the body isn't used to. 
So in youth, these are expressing themselves. People are developing in a healthy way. And Dr. Yamanaka decided, let's see if I take those four very heavily expressed embryonic factors and put them into old cells. Old cells grow young. In fact, the old cells grew so young, they went back to the embryonic stage. And then it took a while, but the scientist says, well, let's try it in live mice. And the live mice grew biologically younger. So these are proteins that you buy from research laboratories. Uh, they're very expensive. You can even buy the AAV, the virus, with the Yamanaka factors already encoded. So you can inject the, the mice with those viruses that have the Yamanaka factors encoded. The viruses bind the DNA, and there you go. You got Yamanaka factors. So please okay. do not buy these. Don't pretend right. you're a scientist to buy these, because we need to study these in people very carefully first. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Here was a question from Zoom. How could these be introduced to a biological system? Because most of our cells probably require the differentiation to do what they do. Well, one of the challenges, we have to infect, for lack of a better word, or let's say deliver uh, enough Yamanaka factors into enough cells to induce systemic regeneration. And that's why there are four to six different delivery methods that we are investigating right now. We'd like to think just lipid nanoparticles would be very much ideal, but in the research that we're gonna initially do, it will be a viral vector introduction. Get those Yamanaka factors in, express them as heavily as we can, because we wanna try to improve on those three mouse studies. We wanna see those mice live 120% longer, 150% longer. We wanna see them rejuvenate more and more and more. So the more that we're able to experiment, and we are are doing it. We've got the mice, we've got the budget, we've got the facility, a multi-billionaire help fund a facility right now. I'll show you that next month, what's going on at that place. It's remarkable what people with money can do if they're intelligent about it, as opposed to just you know, spending it the way they typically do. You have a question over here, Bill. Paola? Did you find any side effect on the mice about doing this type of treatment with them? I didn't understand the question. Side effects. Side effects? Side effects when you do the... Side effects of yeah. Yamanaka factors? Yeah. Well, the, the concern is you're going to make the cells grow too young, too fast, and kill them. Uh, some people worry that there'll be abnormal changes that you don't expect. Uh, so we do have concerns, and that's C-MYC. That's a, that's a proliferative-inducing type of uh, transcription factor, some people are concerned about cancer, which is why m the more modern Yamanaka factor cocktails don't use C-MYC, they use the three out of four, or in some cases, just two out of four, just, just the uh, SOX2 and OC4 combined, that's the super SOX. So there, there are concerns, but those concerns have actually been addressed already, at least on the research front. Now we have to see how well do the mice do. And the mice given Yamanaka factors didn't develop cancer, and the, the, th the third study showed an extended lifespan remaining lifespan. So the cryo, the cryo that you do, it will be individually tested and individually made for each of the individuals okay, that you have the step, test. Step one, we want to replicate and improve the mouse studies. That can be done very quickly. Uh, the monkey research facility we've identified works very quickly, and they've done dozens of studies using the AAV delivery technology for the genes. So we see how well it works in old primates. And now we've got many people who want to volunteer for these studies. Uh, well, we can't do that yet. We need to validate they work in primates, the delivery method, the dose, and we'll start off very slowly with people. But of course, we're pioneers, and being pioneers can be risky. So this is, this is, this is a war against aging and death, and I, I hate to say it, when you're in a battle like that, there's gonna be casualties. We have to accept that risk. I've, I've been taking experimental drugs my whole life, a number of people I know are, and so far we don't know of any casualties. There may have been, but we, we don't know of anyone who died from taking lots of rapamycin and metformin and dasatinib, uh, NAD. I mean, all these different rejuvenating type medications uh, haven't had any deaths that we know of. I remember something you said once, Bill, and that is if you don't do anything, we know what is going to happen. Well, that's the problem, and that's why some of the people over 80 and 90, they're really saying, it doesn't really matter at this stage if this kills me. This is what they're telling me. I say, well, it matters to me. I'll still be around and responsible for you. So, um, but in reality, we've got lots of people who want to experiment with these. And we're gonna start off very slow in people. We may start off with a 5% of a dose that enables an old monkey to grow younger. Just start off 5%, 15%, 25%. It's gonna be a stair-step approach. I have a question here from Robert. Yes, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, 
the, uh, the primary focus on, on all these research facilities are nonprofit. You know what percentage of research facilities that are doing this are nonprofit versus profit? I don't know the percentage, but I know that there are groups doing the same work we are, and that's fantastic. They're funded by the famous billionaires of Silicon Valley. I'm not going to reveal their names. You can probably guess who they are. So we, we're interacting with the scientists in those facilities, letting them know what we're doing. They're divulging a lot of information to us. We're in a race against time. We all want to see the aging process cured. So it's, it's nice to talk to commercial companies who aren't that secretive. Because we give them enough information, they feel, well, let's give them a little bit, too. And as we share information, we build that knowledge base. I have a question back here from Devin. Test, test. Is there a difference in the expression of the Yamanaka factors in uh, cells that have already entered the senescent state? You're talking about senescent cells that are totally senescent? I, I don't know the answer if that's ever been done. You want to remove senescent cells from your body, as you know. Uh, we're looking at cells that have not yet gone fully senescent and hopefully reversing that aging process. We, once you have uh, restored immune function, your immune system will literally get rid of senescent cells. It does that in young people all the time. We suffer immune senescence with aging, and we don't remove those senescent cells, so they accumulate, and they create all kind of damage. Was that notice in the mice? As far as senescent cell removal in the mice, I don't know if they studied that. But they reduced the secretory phenotype. Actually, they did study it. They, they measured what the senescent cells secrete, and they were seeing that reduced in that study. If you remember that slide I showed where they were able to show younger-looking skin, lower inflammation, and a reduced senescence-associated secretory phenotype. So they actually did at least a surrogate measure of senescent cell activity, and it looked like when they extended that remaining lifespan and rejuvenated the animals, there were fewer senescent cells. Whether they were reversed back into younger cells or just killed off by the immune system, I don't know. But your question actually made me respond by what I've already shown. Good. Bill, we have one last question coming from the, the internet, and that is on NAD and ALS. Is there any data on this that you would like there to share? There actually is. If you do enough searching, you'll find some trials out there where they're seeing some limited benefit. And I do get those questions with ALS a, a lot. It's one of those diseases that just has a terrible ending for almost everybody. And I, I would just tell people to read as much as you can, because there's a lot out there in the scientific literature that somehow does not translate into clinical practice very well. So kind of do it yourself. I mean, you, everyone has access right now to all the medical information published everywhere. So take advantage of it. The government uh, has a website, pubmed.gov. Gives you everything for free. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Falloon. Great job as always, Bill. Thank you. Tonight's presentations have been recorded. You'll be able to see them again if you go to our YouTube channel. Share that with your friends. Let them know about this as well. And uh, next month, it'll be the fourth Thursday in February. We hope that you'll be able to come back tonight. Remember that Jose has a book signing in the back here. We have a delicious buffet for you, and you'll be able to meet with Charlie and Bill and Jose now as we go back and go into the party. Thank you for coming tonight. We'll see you next month. May the good Lord be with you down every road you roam. And may sunshine and happiness surround you when you're far from home. And may you grow to be proud, dignified and true. And do unto others as you'd have done to you. The golden rule. Be courageous and be brave, and in my heart you'll always stay, forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young.
Build a stairway to heaven with a prince or a vagabond. And may you never love in vain. And in my heart you will remain forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young. Choose. I'm right behind you, win or lose, forever. 